Hey, Maria. This <clears throat> I'm back with chapter 25. It was at 11 when I woke. The room remained shrouded in false dark, except for that unclosable crack where the light got in. A bright, thin line crossed the floor and ended at the foot of the bed. I rolled away from it. The events of the previous night, previous night flooded back. I closed my eyes again, but it was no good. Despite my longing for apathy, I couldn't just lie there. Cass was being accused of two murders she couldn't have committed. I climbed from bed and moved towards the bathroom. I smelled Tasha's scent still clinging to my skin. Decided to skip the south shower. I wanted to keep the scent the scent's memory close for as long as it wanted to linger. The first matter of business was transportation. I had a raw plan in mind, and cabs or Uber wouldn't work. The desk clerk was the same well-dressed gent from the day before. He offered a cheery smile and asked if I slept well. Nope, I said, but it's not the bed's fault. And what can I do for you this afternoon? Where's the closest place I can rent a car? He thought about it for a moment in a third aperture pose with thumbs and index fingers pressed to his chin. He glazed off, pressed his thin lips together, and narrowed his eyes and actually thought. There's an enterprise, he said at length, about two miles away on Ponce de Leon. The street right over here. Would you like me to call you a car? That's okay, I think I'll walk. He gave me a twisted look. I'm from New York, I told him. I know it's an unfamiliar concept elsewhere. His eyes lit up. The bright lights of Broadway were a long way from the lobby of Chateau Blue. God, I adore my hat, he said. <clears throat> Try living it. I turned to the exit and paused as the door swung open. Two miles in which direction? That would be helpful. Two left. Turn left, he called. You can't miss it. The heat outside hit me like a wet fish to the face. The sky was dull. The humidity observed. I almost turned back and asked for that cab after all, but I made a prideful point about walking. Dumb eagle prevented retreat. I was drenched within a block. At the intercept of Intersection of Alcazar. I leaned in front of the Beto Vita building. I spied a truck to Asha, Silver Camry parked the curbside. I ignored the impulse to leave a note. I'll be back this way in a few hours. Much as I stirred at her, sent in the memory of her contoured face below me, I needed to be, I needed to let her be. I spotted a Starbucks around the corner and saw every dictionary. Refuge, along with a supersized iced coffee. Fortified and temp temporarily cool, I made it the rest of the way without heat stroke. The Enterprise lot was tucked behind a bland beige stretch of businesses. It was empty midday on a Thursday, and I had my choice of rides. I chose a black crown victor, its, it's cop sensibility, and then I was pulling out in, into the jungle climbing in Miami with windows up and AC blasting. I drove north on US-1 through Coconut Grove past the American Airlines Arena, home of the heat and followed the signs of the Mecca off the causeway towards Miami Beach. On one side of the bridge there was a long ugly stretch of intros need, stock rows of shipping, containers and cranes and utilities, tankers <clears throat> being loaded in a trench. On the other side, there was the glittering gate island of the loaded. First palm, first psalm and hot biscuits. Then a little further down, Star Island, home to a certain type of celebrity and the stupid rich. They said Shaq lived there, along with Sylvester Stallone and Gloria Estefan and P. Diddy. Those sorts, you get the idea. Their neighbors were families of Dubai's fortunes, often drug related pharmaceuticals and otherwise. I remember that Al Capone used to live in one of those islands and caves. I couldn't remember which one. This was a town so shameless that it didn't matter where your money came from as long as you had it, and just as important as long as you flaunted it. Not unlike Manhattan, but at least there's the big wealth will always be hidden behind doormen and rough 
wrought iron gates with a six-figure car parked underground and no nine-figure yacht parked out front like neon ad advertising for the cell. I had no plan in Miami Beach other than to walk on the sand. People watched and cleared my head in the salt water. I found a spot near Joe's Stone Crab and crossed through a cluster of new condos to the way, to the water. The ocean was more Caribbean here than the crowded coastal waters along the eastern seaboard. There was no surfing, no torco sea laps, plaquelets on the white sand. <clears throat> Under a palm tree at the edge of the beach, I took off my shirt and wrapped it around my waist in a modified deck change. I slid off my jeans and pulled on my suit. Yesterday, blast of sun had left a light red burn across my layer of pale skin. <clears throat> I ignored the need for the for sun cream. sunscreen. I walked straight to the world like I was being summoned by some unseen power. I strolled in without hesitation until it was up to my waist. Then I dove forward and under bliss, instant brain clearing bliss. Why did I live in a place where I didn't have this tonic on offer at all times? An endo pool was such an inferior substitute. So there were so were so were any pools that for that matter. Nothing could compare with the cleansing shock of diving beneath salt water. I told myself I had fewer problems if I could be near this more often. Maybe I could patch things up with Tasha. I could have convinced her to quit be be a battle leader and find work elsewhere. We could make a life down here. Fool, what a fool I was. Always moving on the impossible. That it might be possible for me to leave New York. I was a prisoner here, like everyone else. I remember a line from wise old Jim Harrison, written soon before he died at, at his desk, with pen in hand and unfinished point before him. We are on old death row living cells of our own devising. As I swam under underwater with open eyes and a blurry brightness, I resolved to toast that line with a whiskey when I got out and found a place to eat. I considered Dr. Lip and his partner, Dr. James Crowley. I needed to learn more about them. I needed to check with Dr. Lip, whether he liked it or not. Tasha had painted him as a kindly age doc, beloved by his patients and staff. Bring your old and your, your impotent, your young and strong. Are you desperate to enhance performance without detention? Come on in. Her moral use, blindness was difficult to reconcile with a sharp woman. I spent the evening with I doubt she was aware of his past activity behind the wall. This was no order for our innocent. This was a man who injected poison into developing bodies. Someone who fucked with body chemistries in the name of sports. He helped lay a mass sacrifice for the greater good of the state. Lip drugged thousands with substance that gave no high, no pleasure, beyond a false pride of winning by cheating. He got away with it all. Maybe he was an, a car carrying member of the Iron Brotherhood like his partner, but he had plenty to answer for. I swam around for a half an hour like an agitated magnet tea. Then I walked across the sand, gathered my jeans and let myself drip dry under the hard midway sun. I strolled along the low tide, taking in the bodies around me. Everyone was fit and bras and broadly exposed. I saw men in the sisters that could have passed for men health models. I saw women in G strings that could have sworn I seen on U porn. It was raw it was a raw parade of body beautiful. I found myself walking with a straighter back, a sunken gut, but it was no use. I was a past street Yankee visitor, made all the more obvious by my increasing burn. When I touched my finger to my shoulder, I saw the tail, the tail tails blotch. Driving back over the causeway, I was feeling almost the same. It will all work out. Cash Prince was on the job and there was sure to be a good reason for that. Even if Kruger forbid others from touching it, it was difficult to deny Captain Sandra Campbell any request. There were marks of torture on Victor Wingate's body. He had to be into some kinky shit if he was with Cass. That didn't mean she followed him out into the woods and pushed him over a waterfall at his favorite spot, where she knew he hiked every day. 
what was her motive? Did she think she would inherit to that house of his? Had I been called to help establish her distress and innocence as the grieving widow? <clears throat> I remember telling Leah about her. It was it always bothered me. The unequal footing of our relationship. Cass knew knew it all from my father's fall to my mother's death. The details of my time in jail to my rehabilitated bad as years on parole. When I learned and established my reputation as an investigator, unlicensed, she was there for, for my descent with the pain pills in a bottle after taking a bullet in the gut, trying to protect her from a stalker. She's been with me ever since, and in those years I learned little about her. I never been to her apartment in the city, knew only that it was in Chinatown, or at least that's what she said. I knew about her dangerous work at the chamber where she whipped and berated conflicts and men desperate to submit. But what else did I know? Our relationship was about the case we were worked on, worked together. Despite my affections for her and our rather unconventional working arrangements, she was always careful to keep it professional. Leah was right. I really I didn't really know her, especially since she re especially since she recuperated with a bullet of her home taken for me during our last case together. She disappeared after that. I seen her once in the hospital while we both recovered and then she fled to the fled the city, joined the Zen retreat upstate near Woodstock and met Victor falling in love. Is it a sign of clarity or madness when you begin to doubt those closer to you? Is it paranoia closing in or an overdue recognition of the truth behind the layers? I tried to banish this tumble line of thought. If I could trust Cass, then all my instances as an investigator were a joke. It would bring down a whole delicate construct. The swim gave me illusions of lunacy. But as I recrossed the causeway, my mind was muddled with doubt and confusion. It was a little before 4 p.m. when I returned to Coral Gables. I found a spot across the street from the BioVita offices and settled in for a late afternoon stakeout. I searched my Miami FM radio options. The majority of the stations were either Spanish or hip-hop. I settled on 105.9 a classic rock station that had decided the 90s were old enough to be classic. I could have bagged the Navier, but when Pearl Jane, Pearl, Pearl Jane Jam came on, I turned off the radio and chose silence over Eddie Vedder. The building began to empty a, a the building began to empty a few minutes after five. I noticed the platinum hair fake titty Tiffany talking to a tone. Latino stood in a shirt that was two sizes too small. I spent untold hours watching workers leave their office back home. While I was spying on something or others, they all looked the same in the city, moneyed and exhausted. Too past it to look back at anyone. Down here, folks moved with a peacock and that was dis disconcerting. Instead of eye cast down and inward, everyone seemed to st search out scoping for connection. When I spotted Tasha, I sank low in my seat and looked away. She had no reason to recognize the crown Vic, but I was a little disappointed when she claimed, when she climbed up to the camera and drove over out a glance in my direction. I was beginning to think I had missed lip exit when a black S class Mercedes sedan pulled from the lot beneath the building. My only image of the daughter was a decade old photo posted online during his German court trial. But Tosh's description was out. Behind the wheel, he looked like a kinky crunk Santa. His cheeks were ruddy, his hair and beard white and neatly trimmed. The vanity placed on the bands were aged dark. He turned right and I pulled out and followed a new car back. back. Lip turned, into, turned onto US-1 and was heading north. Just before we reached the downtown, he signaled and turned on the Ricker Biker Causeway bound for Key. Back came. The bridge was longer and prettier than the MacArthur Outery to Miami Beach, with clear expanses of Back Cane Bay in that soft shade of blue unique to South Florida. As we reconnected with land, 
We pass through a stretch of protective mangroves before reaching the settled patch of the key. It was a short drive from the mainland, an island hop from showy South Beach, but key back back came felt like a separate civilization universe. There was a sense that mothers and children seldom left. There were school and playgrounds and all the water sports you could wish for. The breadwinners would be forced to leave each day to Miami proper. But there was a peace and calmness here not present in the, the rest of the city. Still, that didn't mean the wealth was any less conspicuous. As I followed it down Harbor Drive, the homes behind the gates announced themselves like loud art spread beneath the palms. There were no cars between us now. If he'd been playing, paying attention, he would have made me. He would. There were no cars between. If he would have been. If if he been paying attention, he would have made me. When lips slowed and signaled in front of a high white gate, I passed without glancing over. In my rear view, I watched as the bands went through and the gate closed behind him. I turned around and double parked on the corner. There were camera visible in the treetops and no pedestrians in the neighborhood. Watch sign in front of me. I wouldn't be able to allow it for long. Five minutes later, the gates reopened and the man himself appeared between them. He was short and paunchy with a proud manner. He moved lightly in his loafers. Lip was dressed in a blue linen pants and an orange silk shirt, which covered a deep tan. He looked at my car and lifted an arm and waved like he was greeting an old friend. Recognizing across a room, I almost waved back. I watched him approach, roll down the window. If he wanted to, talk. Wonderful, so did I. Got a tag, he said, leaning in. I looked down at his fingers, resting on the window screen. There were small and stubby and expertly manicured. manicured. Tropian. He waited until I met his gaze and gave me a relaxed smile. He was a man in confidence control of his environment. I didn't know when he picked up my tail, but I done a shit job. Why don't you join me inside, he asked. It's much more comfortable in theory. He glanced up at the dull, heavy sky. It was too warm out here. Come, I'll get you a drink. He nodded and walked back towards his property, never doubting that I would follow. I turned off the car and opened the door and tripped after him like a kid late for school. He pressed an opener in his pocket and the gate swung wide. He didn't wait for me to catch up. As we approached the house, I noted her. I noticed her car. Tasha Silver Camel park by the front door. Lip glanced over his shoulders. Yeah, she is here too, he said. We all talk, the three of us, Ja. I sensed him smiling with his back to me. I looked up at the house. It was a white beast of right, bright angels. Angels in dark glasses at the M- balls of the eighties. When the city crane in its Miami Vice heydays, it looked like a film set, a home fit for a fictional drug dealer with a, a catch of automatic weapons in the closet and bodyguards looking into the shadows. At the door, he turned and said, I'm so glad you followed. We had much to discuss. And y'all, I'll be back with chapter 26. And y'all have a good day.